2021 was a record year of journalists' imprisonment and the number of female reporters being detained for their work rose by one third, according to media watchdog Reporters Without Borders. The organization recorded a 20% surge in the number of journalists arbitrarily being detained, including VOA Hausa reporter Grace Abu in December of 2020. Of the 488 detained, 60 were women, the highest number of female journalists likely to be jailed that Reporters Without Borders has ever documented. With more women working in media worldwide, the risk of arrest or attack is rising, especially sexual harassment in newsrooms. In two recent studies, female journalists say they feel unsafe working in at least 40 countries. Most of the female journalists list sexual harassment as the biggest issues facing them in their home countries. 85% of the respondents say harassment is common and 30% say it often leads to sexual assault. The question remains, why are female journalists under fire and how does it impact the quest for press freedoms? Hello, I am Simmanyu Shekoya and this is Our Voices. According to Committee to Protect Journalists, a press freedom non-profit organization, Egypt remains the worst failure of journalists in Africa, with 25 incarcerated, but fewer than the past years. Rwanda follows, knocking Cameroon from the rank of fourth worst jailer in Africa, with seven journalists behind bars, and many of them are YouTubers. Ethiopia has done the deepest backslide, dashing hopes of press reform after Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed came into power, with 21 jailed as of December 2021. According to CPJ, Ethiopia is the third worst jailer in Africa after Egypt and Eritrea. Advocates say the recent case of an Associated Press journalist being accused of abating a government designated terrorist group for reporting on rebels highlights Ethiopia's decline in media freedom. VOA Salem Solomon has more. Amir Aman Kiaro is back home with his family after a four month ordeal in an Ethiopian prison. But the video journalist for the Associated Press could still face jail if convicted of violating anti-terrorism and wartime state of emergency laws. First arrested in November, Amir is accused of illegally communicating with members of a group the government designated as a terrorist organization. Under a state of emergency that was in place until February, journalists could be penalized for interviewing members of armed groups including the Oromo Liberation Army. Amir and a freelancer, Thomas Ngada, were detained but never charged, the AP says. The crackdown on the media that this case represents, there is truly uh, no uh, accusation, uh, true accusation that can be leveled against Amir. He is a respected, balanced journalist who has covered both sides of the conflict. Um, he's been picked up and this is an arbitrary detention. With a shrinking space for reporting, several Ethiopian journalists called on the government to respect media rights. In 2021 alone, their open letter says 46 journalists were detained, making Ethiopia one of the worst jailers of journalists in Africa. The general optimism um, that we had a couple of years ago with the much heralded reform, with the promises that journalists would be able to operate unperturbed, um, this has not panned out. Uh, the promises and the pledges did not materialize. And unfortunately uh, for journalists, the situation uh, is starting to mirror what we saw in 2009, when Ethiopia passed its infamous anti-terror proclamation, uh, which was used to round up journalists en masse. So we had to speak up about a very, very dire situation um, that our colleagues on the ground in Ethiopia are facing. With little coverage of daily life in rebel-controlled regions like Oromia, the work of reporters like Amir is vital, says Zakarias. Very few journalists have been able to gain access to areas under control uh, of the OLA. And what life has been like for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in these areas, much of which have been um, subjected to uh, internet and phone outages, uh, we don't have an, uh, an accurate picture of. Amir's lawyer, Tadele Gebremedin, says his client has been ordered to not leave the country until the case is investigated. He's accused of working with foreign media outlets and, quote, spoiling the country's development plans, end quote, through negative reporting. We will continue to 
uh, cover the story of uh, journalists who are unjustly held. Um, the, this is not uh, acceptable behavior. These are arbitrary detentions. If there, if there is proof of uh, something, then that evidence has to be surfaced and has to go through um, a proper uh, trial process. For now, Amir is free, but the risk of arrest for those in media is ever present. Salem Solomon, VOA News, Washington. Journalist Rio Talamu was imprisoned in Ethiopia. She is one of the many who have been arrested, interrogated, and threatened in her country. Upon her release in 2015, and despite increasing dangers, she remains fearless in the commitment to her work for independent media. She refuses to self-censor in a place where that practice is standard. I recently spoke to her about how prison affected her personal life and work as a journalist. In terms of personal life, I had tumors in my breasts and the prison authorities denied uh, to get treatment and surgery. After many advocacy groups uh, were uh, advocating for my rights to get uh, treatment, they allowed me for surgery, but they didn't allow me to went back to hospital after surgery. I had to get follow-up and other treatments, but couldn't uh, get it. Because of prison's unhealthy environment, uh, I was suffering from sinusitis. Uh, I had sleep deprivation in prison, and it continues until now. Uh, I'm not the same person like I was uh, before prison in many aspects. In other words, it affects also my professional life in some ways. Mm -hmm. It has been, I think, over six years since you have been mm -hmm. released and um, you are still practicing journalism, um, mm -hmm. even though you are in the United States now. How do you see the press freedom situation now uh, compared to how it was before? Mm. Yeah, when I compare it before, it was uh, four years ago. Uh, the new administration came to power before four years. There were good changes and hopes. Uh, even there were no uh, single journalists in prison. But after a short time, the bad habits appear again, and the government began to arrest journalists and continue repression. Therefore, now it becomes worse when I compare it to uh, this uh, when Abiy administration came to power. Before four years, there are independent organizations at this time. I can mention one, Ethiopian mass media professionals associations. If they strengthen their capability and continue independently, things will change, I think. Or the government may continue the obstacles on them and the situation becomes uh, worse. Uh, and maybe they will resist it and continue as they uh, are exercising now or not. I don't know because of that. I have a fear. Now you are forced to work um, from outside your country because of the imprisonment and the repression you faced. How, what is the difference between working from here and working from, um, from Ethiopia? You can go different places and you can get the information from the horse's mouth when you are in Ethiopia, but when you are here, uh, it reduces. Because of that, you feel like there is a gap uh, uh, therefore, it affects us emotionally. You, uh, you, did, you don't satisfy by your work because you are here. Uh, you think you miss something, even if you don't miss something. According to that, I think uh, there is a difference between uh, be here and be there. Joining me to discuss press freedoms and the rise of the number of journalists jailed on the African continent are my co-hosts, Ndiniake, Orion, Amina, and our guest, Angela Quintal, the Committee to Protect Journalists, Africa Program Coordinator. We began our conversation on the detention of journalists in Ethiopia and their subsequent release. After Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed came to power in 2018, the media situation had improved. But now uh, we are seeing a significant backslide. How do you evaluate the press freedom situation in Ethiopia currently? Sure, so let's go back to those initial days when everyone looked at Ethiopia and thought that Ethiopia would be the good news story. In 2018, 
when we had our annual prison census, there was not a single journalist in jail in Ethiopia. What I do remember is how, in fact, Addis was host that following year, right? And Prime Minister Abiy was there quoting CPJ figures and everyone had the sense of positivity. And we saw things decline over the years until last year, of course, when the state of emergency was declared and we suddenly saw an even bigger crackdown on journalists. And the majority of journalists that we had on our prison census were in fact arrested post that state of emergency. And at one stage, we had at least 14 journalists in jail in Ethiopia. And that made Ethiopia the second worst jailer of journalists in sub-Saharan Africa. In Africa, with Egypt leading on the number of journalists behind bars, you would then say that, that uh, Ethiopia was the third worst. But in sub-Saharan Africa, back up there as second. And that's why I say it is now the bad news story. It is the one that you look at and you think an opportunity lost, uh, a massive opportunity lost. You mentioned earlier how Egypt is uh, the one with the most journalists in jail. But at, at 25, they are fewer than in the past. So does that mean that there is somewhat an improvement in the media environment? And then also, what is the overall impact of these crackdowns and arrests? Does it you know, create more self-censorship or the number of maybe journalists practicing on the decline? You know, the fact that there are less journalists in jail in Egypt this year means that things have improved. Well, certainly not, it hasn't improved. And what you've seen in terms of years of arrests of journalists and a crackdown on journalists is that space for independent journalism gets smaller and smaller. Uh, either journalists leave, they stop working as journalists, or they self-censor. What I can also say, of course, is that how many months later, and we still have 25 journalists in jail in, in Egypt, so it's not as though there's a a sense that they might be released after a couple of months, right? Or a couple of weeks, they are still there. Looking at it, the East African region, like specifically like in Rwanda, uh, what are what most people see as a thriving nation on many spectrums, but also with seven journalists behind bars, majority of them being YouTubers. Can you speak a little bit about what that means? Sure. So of course there is a disconnect between Rwanda and the international image that it may have as a development state. You know, you often hear people say, oh, the streets are so clean in Kigali and, and so on and so on. But what you don't see is what's happening behind the scenes and the crackdown and the censorship on free expression. You know, uh, in fact, Rwanda, in terms of our prison census for last year, um, in sub-Saharan Africa, overtook Cameroon as the worst jailer of journalists and became the third worst jailer. You've seen people move into a new platform to express themselves. And you see that in other countries as well. So you have your traditional platforms, newspapers, television, and so on. But suddenly people are expressing themselves on YouTube, on social media. And so what we've seen is of the seven journalists currently in jail in Rwanda, six of them are actually YouTubers. And again, as we've seen in Ethiopia, what you have is a sense that it's arbitrary arrests, arbitrary detention. This is what we're talking about in Rwanda, and we have not seen any improvement. That is over and above issues that obviously one should, needs to be concerned about in terms of surveillance. You know, It is a surveillance state. And what does that mean for journalists and others wanting to express their opinions? you see the self-censorship. And, uh, and unfortunately, that is another bad news story for, for sub-Saharan Africa is Rwanda. So thank you for all of that, Angela. But when we move to West Africa, we see that there has been a new trend in missing journalists with Olivier Dubois abducted on April 8th last year. So it's been more than a year since he was kip kidnapped by a jihadist group. Can you tell us about some of the cases of missing journalists in that region, including Mali? Sure. So, so Mali is the one case that is top of mind for many people, obviously, because of the first anniversary. 
uh, where Olivia Dubois was actually, uh, you know, went to to in, uh, interview a jihadist leader, and was then um, was then kidnapped. And we've only had two videos in which we have heard him talk and where he makes an appeal to the French authorities. Olivia Dubois is a French uh, journalist for to to assist in his release. We're also investigating two other cases of journalists in Mali who have also, we've been told, have been abducted. I cannot tell you now for sure that, in fact, there are three journalists in, in, who are, have been abducted by jihadist groups in Mali because we're still investigating the two. But if you look elsewhere in the region, uh, missing journalists, I mean, let's just look um, in the neighboring country to mine. I'm South African in Mozambique where there has been a massive crackdown because of the instability and the conflict and journalists are caught up in there. So you actually also have censorship there where the authorities obviously don't want journalists to do their work and to expose what is going on. A mass detention of journalists for what? For journalism, because they were simply covering what was going on. Uh, it's unconscionable that three of them still remain in jail. It's time for a break. When we return, we will look at new global media study that finds female journalists are too scared to report sexual harassment in their workplace. Stay with us. Empowerment and humanity towards a better world. Economic and social progress of every society. Facts and information from key players rather than spectators in politics, business, science and technology. City, rural, educated, all underprivileged. We care and we listen to what matters to you. Your, Your voices, voices are our voices. Welcome back. You are watching Our Voices. A new global study produced by World Association of News Publishers, women in news that focused on newsroom environments across the regions of Africa and Middle East, Southeast Asia, Eurasia and select countries in Central America shows that 41% of women in media professionals have experienced sexual harassment in the workplace. Kenyan journalists reported the highest level of harassment in their newsrooms at 56% among the 20 countries examined in the study. Victoria Amuga has more from Nairobi. Gadoni Kuria's negative experience with a supervisor at a Kenyan media outlet derailed her plans for a career in journalism. I went to pitch an idea to him and he was just looking at my hips intentionally, very intentionally. Like he, he, I'm speaking to him, but he's like just looking at my hips and then going up to my breast and not looking at my face. Kuria worked at the same media house for two years, trying to launch her career in print and broadcast. But she says rejecting sexual advances from a supervisor changed that trajectory. Her harasser wasn't interested in her professional growth. He did not really care whether I published or not. He did not even sweat or struggle to, to, to even tell me go do a certain story unless I came up with an idea. And that idea would be merged up sometimes with someone else's story. So you see, I became all, almost like just a trophy seated at the desk. Kuria's former supervisor told VOA her claims are ridiculous and suggested she report them to the police. Kuria's case isn't isolated. Around 65% of female journalists surveyed in Kenya say they face physical or verbal harassment. The figure puts Kenya top of a list of 20 countries included in a study by the World Association of Newspapers and News Publishers, or one IFRA's Women in News Organization and City University of London. The study also shows in about 80% of cases, women do not report the incidents. One way to curb the problem is to highlight it, say local advocates. Create that open environment and safe spaces for people to talk about sexual harassment. Then the person who wants to hide in, in, in the secrecy of it to harass their victims will... Um, of course, they will feel exposed. It can be hard to secure justice too. Harassers risk being fired, but they still find work elsewhere. So the Association of Women Media in Kenya is creating a special committee to help bring suspected attackers to court. There are cases where we've had even an intern uh, raped at a gunpoint uh, in Kisumu. But if you look at, look at even how that case was handled, the media house sat, listened to the case, found the, girl, uh, the guy guilty and fired him. 
But after he was fired, went to another media house. So the cycle continues. There's no redress. There's no punishment. There's no justice for the victim. Kuria for now has abandoned her aspirations to be a journalist. But media advocates hope the Women in News study will shine a light on sexual harassment in the newsrooms and offer support for reporters like Kuria. Victoria Amunga for VOA News, Nairobi. Nigerian journalists on the front lines of conflict reporting are receiving trauma support from a new media initiative. Timothy Obidu reports from Abuja. While the world focuses its attention on Russia and Ukraine, journalist and filmmaker Bivan Magoni has documented the sectarian violence ravaging his hometown in Kaduna State in northern Nigeria since 2016. He wants his documentary to raise awareness about the killings and to hold those responsible accountable. But Magoni says years of interviewing conflict survivors are taking a toll on his emotional well-being. I go to a place where 40 dead bodies have been buried. I go and count like 100 dead um, mass graves. Like um, I go to count graves of, of over 100 people being buried. Trust me, no matter how, um, no matter how strong-willed you are, when you come back, it's going to take a toll on you. When women begin to tell you how their children were killed in their presence, when you come up across people, survivors, who's without limbs, whose hands were chopped off, chopped off, their legs were cut off, and all of that. Magoni says coverage of conflict is affecting his mood and making it hard to finish his documentary. The World Health Organization estimates one in four Nigerians, some 50 million people, suffer from some form of mental illnesses, sometimes triggered by conflict or economic hardships. But access to psychological support at hospitals or with specialists is limited. That's where Nigeria's Center for Journalism, Innovation and Development comes in. Partnering with a psychological services group, the center offers support to newsrooms and free counseling to journalists experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. So journalists see a lot of things, but they cannot um, represent them on their various mediums. So there's a, there's, they need an outlet. A number of them go through PTSD. So I'll give an inst well, not an instance, for one of the organizations that we had held a session for, more than half of their staff were going through PTSD. So that More than 100 journalists have benefited from the program since it started in 2019. Among them is Aisha Babatunde, who covers the Boko Haram conflict for the Nigerian news website, Humango. So uh, in the course of the program, I, can, I realized it was very important for me to point out some of the things we go through mentally, like. Uh, stress, how do you react to this when you are stressed, how do you react, are you passive, aggressive? Babatunde says her employers include periodic trauma support as part of the benefits for staff. But the Center for Journalism wants more newsrooms to welcome the initiative. This program or this project is good, is good to scale. I think every newsroom, if possible, should have a, an in-house therapist if you can. The skills and support the program offers could help journalists like Magoni, who plans to attend a session soon. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. It's time for another break, but first, what can be done in newsrooms to allow female journalists to report without gender-based biases, inequalities in their assignments, or harassment? Please share your thoughts on our social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and our handle is at VOA Our Voices. We are also on WhatsApp, and our number is on the screen. When we return, we will introduce you to six journalists who started Somalia's first all-female media team. But first, we will hear from my VOA colleagues on the challenges female journalists experience in their career. For me, I had an event in New York where I was covering a live program at the United Nations. I had a male come up to me while I was on the live program, berated me, 
harassed me but i continued with my program which showed me that women have to work twice as hard and also sometimes you have to turn a blind eye at the noise and concentrate on what you're doing my appeal to fellow female journalists kindly break the silence by reporting sexual harassment cases at workplace to relevant authority remember it doesn't matter whom you are reporting be it your boss or a source your dignity is paramount thank you on voa our voices women are using their voices to empower to nurture to educate to stand up in any language amajiku yachu dims action mario yemu mazwi edu our voices Welcome back to Our Voices. Here is this week's Women Twitch segment. A team of six leading female senior news producers from Somalia recently launched the nation's first all-female newsroom. Their aim is to present more stories about women to the audience that is free of any sexual harassment. Somalia's first women-run radio and television company opened in Mogadishu. Supported by the United Nations, Bilan Media plans to produce stories important to women and their rights in the conservative country. Bilan means bright and clear in the Somali language. The launch of Bilan Media marks a step forward in the efforts by Somali women to take a more active part in this male-controlled society. By going all female, Bilan hopes to gently break apart Somalia's conservative society. Sexual harassment in the newsroom, cultural stereotypes, and pressure from families, as well as low pay, are among some of the issues female journalists have to face in a much more challenging work environment compared to their male counterparts. Not only reporting on those long-neglected issues, Bilan Media provides a safe community for female journalists by shielding them from those attacks. The Committee to Protect Journalists say at least 71 reporters or journalists have been killed in the ongoing civil war by Islamist militant groups. These women are using their voices in an all-female newsroom. Do you know any women who are working towards creating a safer working environment for female journalists or in any other field? If so, please let us know and share your comments using the hashtag #VOAourvoices. That's our show for this week. On behalf of the Voice of America and my our voice colleagues, I am Samantha Shekoye. Thanks for watching. Uh -huh.